word in the Greek there is most. The Amplified says the large body of Christ, the love of most is going to wax cold. And this is not just something that could happen. It's what's going to be the norm. And iniquity is bounding today. So how do you deal with this? And then my second message, what I did was uh, take David over in First uh, Samuel chapter 30, where he was facing a situation where his own men were speaking of killing him. He had lost his wives, his children. Uh, he had been frustrated for 13 years. Everything in his life had gone negative, And yet he encouraged himself in the Lord. He brought the ephod and he began to inquire of God. And that's the equivalent of us turning to the word of God and looking for an answer. And I took Psalms chapter 19 verses 17 through I think 15 about how that the word of God will convert your soul. It'll restore you back to an original condition. And you've got to get to where you take the word of God and begin to encourage yourself. And you know, this is exactly what Dennis has been doing in his two sessions. He took Gideon and showed you how God encouraged Gideon when Gideon was in a very bad situation. He talked about Paul last night. What Dennis is doing is just doing exactly what I was talking about, taking the word, going to the word and using the word to encourage yourself and keep yourself positive. So I want to continue along those lines today. Look over here in Numbers chapter 13. To me, this is the uh, most amazing example of negativism in the world and negative reports and how it affects people and turns their hearts cold towards God. The 13th chapter of the book of Numbers is where Moses sent spies out to spy out the promised land. And, you know, they went out to evaluate the promised land. Moses sent them out for the purpose of finding out what the condition of the land was, but he didn't send them out and ask them to bring back a report. Can we take the land? That was not what he sent them to do. They were just supposed to report back on where the strongholds were and, and so that they could have a plan of how to go in and take it over. But you know the story. Matter of fact, I was with David Barton about, I'm not sure the exact number of years, maybe five or six years ago, and I was with him in Washington, D.C. If you haven't been on that uh, David Barton tour of the Capitol where he goes through and shows you all of the statues and statuary hall, and I mean, I'd say nine out of ten of them are, are clergy, are people, godly people who loved God. And he just goes through and shows you the history of this nation and stuff. And it was powerful. And we had a lot of senators and congress people come in and speak to us. And they were all godly people. And they meet together and they're praying every day. And after two days of just seeing all of these things and hearing these... Uh, congressional leaders come in and speak. I went up to David and I said, man, I had no idea it was this good. I said, everything you hear is just all bad about how terrible everything is. And he says, you've been listening to the 10 Spies Network. <laughs> and I said, that's what's been happening. And this is what happened. Moses sent them out. They came back and look at what they said here in Numbers chapter 13. It says uh, in verse 27, And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And they had to carry one cluster of grapes on a pole in between two men. Those grapes must have been as big as apples for you know two men to have to carry this on a pole. And they said, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Those are giants. The children of Anak were giants. So they were large people. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the, Philist and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. And what did you call that? The Mediaites last night? I thought that was good. They dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. 
But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Did you know, they didn't say anything that wasn't true. It's not like that those cities weren't walled. It's not, it's not like that they weren't large people. They were giants. They were bigger than them. Everything they said was true. But you've got to take the truth and put it into the proper perspective. It was true that they were large cities. It was true that they were walled. Jericho was a walled city. And you know, I've got somewhere else I'm wanting to go this morning, so I'm not going to go through this whole thing. But if you turned over to Joshua chapter uh, 2, I believe it is, that Joshua sent out two spies to check out the land. Now make the comparison. Moses sent out 12 spies and only two of them had a good report. Joshua only sent out two spies. He got rid of the unbelievers. He only picked people that were going to go and bring back a good report. You need to be careful about how you get information. Joshua had learned a lesson. So he only sent out two spies. And when they came into Rahab's house, Rahab told them, says, from the day that we heard that the Lord dried up the Red Sea from before you, our hearts melted within us and we had no strength at all. That was 40 years before. Did you know if the Israelites had have known what the people, what these giants were actually feeling, they could have walked in and it would have been a cakewalk going in and taking the land. They had no problem. If the Lord would have told them that when you go to Jericho, all you got to do is march around it and then yell and the walls are going to fall down flat. He didn't tell them how they were going to win. He didn't tell them the battle plan. If they would have had somehow or another victory assured unto them, these people probably would have believed Joshua and Caleb instead of the ten spies. But the Lord wants us to live by faith. The Lord doesn't show you the end from the beginning. There's multiple reasons for this, but most of it is because of you. If you knew what the end was from the beginning, and if you knew some of the things you'd have to deal with, many of us would, you'd either become so impatient and you wouldn't take time to grow. The things of God come step by step by step and you would become so impatient you would try and short circuit, you'd try and make things come to pass, you'd get out ahead of God, you'd go up presumptuously as they did in the 14th chapter and it would lead to your own destruction. Or you'd be so overwhelmed with what God showed you and what his plans for you are that you would think, I can't do this. You'd run the other direction feeling I'm not cut out for this. You know, it was uh, August the 26th, uh, 2019, that I was out in my spa early in the morning before the sun came up. And I was just praising God and worshiping God for all the good things he had done. And I saw these patterns that every 12 years, something really miraculous. I mean, 12 year segments, just miraculous things happened in my life and ministry. And so I was sitting out there praising God. And it was at the end of one of these 12 year segments. And I said, God, what's going to happen in the next 12 years? And I mean, immediately, just like this, I got, you don't want to know. <laughs> and I thought, well, I do want to know. And, he, you know, God's not going to argue with you. That's just it. There was silence after that. And I, I thought about that a long time. And now, here I am over a year and a half removed. And some of the things that we've been through with the... Uh, state filing suit against us and threatening us to put us in jail and tried to get a permanent injunction against us and on another thing. You know what? I'm glad I didn't know. I'm glad I'm just walking with God. I don't know, but I, I know that I'm going to win. I know some things, but you know, you don't, God doesn't show you everything. He didn't show them that, hey, I promise you when you go to Jericho, the walls are going to fall down flat and you'll win automatically. But he did promise them that they would possess the land. He promised them that uh, it was already a done deal. He had already promised them victory, but he doesn't give you all of the details. So anyway, these spies brought back a negative report. You know, the scripture says in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It didn't say only life is in the power of your words, but death and life. And that's not only your tongue, that's every tongue. Every word that you hear 
has either life or death in it. There is no such thing as a middle ground that's just wasted time. It doesn't mount to anything. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, every idle word that you speak, that men speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. He didn't, he, he said even the idle words, that word in the Greek means non-productive. Even when you're just sitting here and speaking casually and stuff and doing things, you're going to give an account for every word. Every word. There is no such thing as bad words and good words and then just a whole bunch of words that don't count. Every word that you speak and every word that you hear is either ministering life or death. If you could somehow or another get this visual thing that out of my mouth are coming words and these words contain things. I'm speaking the word of God. It contains life. It contains hope. It contains faith if you receive it. But when you listen to other people, every word is containing something. And the sad fact is the vast majority of words that we hear contain death. And that's what these 10 spies did. They didn't speak untruth. Everything they said was true. The walls were high. The people were big. But where they missed it was they said because of these things we cannot overcome them. They, they went on to say uh, in verse 32 and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel saying the land uh, through which we is gone to search it is a good is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and the people that we saw in it were of great stature and there we saw the giants the sons of Anak which came of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so were we in their sight did you know it didn't matter what the giants thought of them it doesn't matter what the people that don't have your vision and what God called you to do it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you it's what you say about yourself this goes along exactly with what Dennis was saying yesterday about Gideon. God called him a mighty man of valor. He had to get to where he said the same thing about himself and he had to go through five tests to prove that to himself. It doesn't matter what other people say about you. What do you say about yourself? The fact was they said we were as grasshoppers in their sight and so were we in our own sight. It doesn't matter what the giants think about you. You know, if David would have gone out and killed a dwarf, nobody would be talking about him thousands of years later. They'd have arrested him. How dare you go fight a dwarf? The very fact that he fought a giant, man, that's what made him famous. That's what catapulted him to a position of leadership. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Man, I've got testimony after testimony of miracles that God has done for me and there are situations that were bigger than me. And because of it, it builds faith in people when I share these things. When you overcome nothing, nobody gets inspired by that. Amen. They lived in they, these giants. They had huge houses. They were going to go inhabit houses that were built by giants. They were big houses. Instead of looking at the positive side, they took facts, but they interpreted those facts negatively. I tell you, our media today, the mediaites, as somebody said last night, they have become masters of taking the facts and twisting them into a way that pre pre presents the worst possible light and uh, you know result to it. And sad to say, most Christians are going to the Ten Spies Network to get their information. I'm telling you, if you do that, you are going to hear about all of the iniquity that's abounding and the love of the majority of believers is going to wax cold because of iniquity abounding in the way it's been presented. And of course, you know the end results of this was that uh, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And remember, Joshua chapter 2, the people's hearts in the land of Canaan, their heart had already melted, their strength was gone from them. If they would have gone ahead and have obeyed God, they would have had a much easier time in the beginning than they had 40 years later after the people had had 40 years to prepare and build up their strength. It's the same with us. You've got to get to where you don't go by what the world has to say, what the facts have to say. You need to go by what God's word has to say 
That's the reason that the Word of God and keeping your, your focus on the Word of God is the only way that you're ever going to overcome the negativity that exists in this world. Let me turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 and I want to use Abraham as an example of a person who stayed positive in a negative world. And uh, you know the scripture says in Genesis chapter 12 that when Abraham entered into the land of Canaan he was 75 years old. He was 100 years old when he had the promised seed and he lived to be 175 years old and during that 100 year period of time he never did see the complete fulfillment of everything that God had told him. I'm not going to take time to go into this but it actually says in Acts chapter 7 that the Lord spoke to Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees to leave his father and his brethren and everything and come out into a land that he would show them. And according to Genesis chapter 11, he left Ur with his father, with his brother, and with his nephew. And then his brother died. His brother's name was Haran. And they lived there for a period of time. And he waited until his father died, Tira died. And then he came into the land of Canaan. He was 75 at that time. But the point I'm making is, it wasn't just from 75 until 100 years old. The Lord spoke to him when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. And we don't know how much time it took him to obey. Uh, I've tried to figure this out and I can't nail it down. But I think it could have been 30 years or more that he came from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran before he came into the land. So if you add that 30 years to this, it could have been anywhere from 100 to 130 years that Abram never saw the complete fulfillment of his desires. How did he deal with this? You know, I've already used this verse over in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you don't see the thing that you're believing for come to pass, and it passes a certain time, it tends to make your heart sick. How did Abraham deal with this disappointment, this delayed manifestation of the things that God had told him? How did he do that? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us how Abraham and Sarah did this. So let me just read some of this to you. In Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out unto a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She was 91 years old when she had Isaac. And it says that she, it had ceased to be with her after the manner of wisdom. women. She had gone through menopause decades before and yet here she was revived and she received strength uh, to conceive through her faith. In verse um, 12 it says, Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars in the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith. And here's what I was wanting to focus on. It shows you some things that they did to be able to persevere, to stay strong, to stay positive in a negative situation. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. They didn't see the full manifestation of the promise. The Lord had given Abraham the promise in Genesis 14 and 15 that if you can count the stars in the sky or if you can number the grains of sand on the seashore, so shall your seed be. In other words, your children are going to be so numerous it's impossible to count them. And it says in Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God. He didn't have any children. He didn't have any hope of having children in the natural. And yet he believed God. He had a promise that your children are going to be innumerable. And so he had promises from God. He didn't see the full manifestation of it in his lifetime. 
But he had a promise from God. So if you are going to be strong and positive in a negative world, you have to have some promises from God. And did you know all of us have general promises from God? And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but many people haven't personalized the Word of God. They haven't taken it to where it's, it's God's promises to you. You read these things and you think, well, God promised Paul this. He promised him all these things. It's got to become personal to you. And this is why so many people are going through life without a direction. You just are doing your own thing and you're asking God to bless your plans. Oh God, bless this business. Oh God, bless this decision. You know, I don't ever ask God to bless what I'm doing because I don't do things. I try not to do anything that is my own choosing. I just seek the Lord and I wait until God tells me to do something. And if God tells you to do it, it's already blessed. To get God to bless your plans is wrong. You need to run up a white flag, become a living sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, and then renew your mind so that you are just doing what the Word tells you to do. And when you do that, you're automatically blessed. So anyway, um, most people haven't taken these things and personalized them. I, don't, I really want to get through some other things, but let me just say this quickly in Jesus' name. Man, most of my time's already gone. Anyway, I, I had an experience with the Lord uh, in January 1993, just a couple of months after Jamie and I were married. And it's a long story, but the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. I went into a room, and I mean, the presence of God was so real. I just sat there for hours, afraid to open my eyes, afraid of what I'd see. And finally, God, what do you what do you want? And God told me he was giving me the same choice that he gave uh, Solomon and I could pick anything I want. And I was an introvert and I'd been trying to minister the word for a couple of years and it was just pitiful and I was afraid of people and I just froze every time I got in front of people. And so I said, I want the ability to speak your word without fear. And he touched my mouth and put his words in my mouth and gave me promises out of Jeremiah chapter 1 before I formed you in your mother's womb before you came forth out of the belly I sanctified you I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations and Jeremiah said oh Lord God I can't speak I'm a child and he said don't you ever say I can't speak because you will go to the nations and then he touched his mouth and put his words in his mouth and Jeremiah 5 14 because you speak this word I will make my word in your mouth fire and the people would and it shall devour them and anyway that's a real quick synopsis but those scriptures became mine he may have spoken them to Jeremiah but they were me God spoke that to me it transformed my life it has totally changed my life they are promises to me. And I can promise you that everything in here, God has given promises. You need to take them and make them your own. If you will open up your heart and study the word, God will speak to you and say things like, no weapon formed against you will prosper. That's not only written to Isaiah. That's not only Isaiah speaking to the people of his day. That's a promise to you. You need to meditate on it until it becomes yours. So Abraham and Sarah, they had promises. God had spoken things to them. You have promises. I could spend all morning on this one thing, but this is nothing but promises to you of what God is and what he wants to do in your life, but you've got to personalize it. You've got to make it so that it's no longer a promise to Peter or Paul or somebody else, but it's yours. These are my promises. God has spoken these to me. So first of all, they had promises that were from God. They didn't receive a full manifestation in their life, but it goes on to say, but having seen them afar off. I just happened to have an entire book on this entitled The Power of Imagination. You have to be able to see with your heart what God has promised you. And there are so many people that they can quote, by his stripes we're healed. They can say, by his stripes we were healed. They can say that he himself bore our infirmities and carried our sicknesses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their distresses. And on and on, you can, go, you can quote scriptures, 
but you still see yourself sick. If you can't see it on the inside, you'll never see it on the outside. You have to take the Word of God, it has to become personal, and then you have to see it. Man, like I said, I've got an entire book on this. I don't want to spend all the rest of my time this morning on this, but it is so important that you start seeing what God says about you. You know, I took the scripture, John 14, 12, that says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Jesus spoke that to me. He spoke it to you too, but I personalized, I made it mine, and I said, Father, you told me that, and yet I haven't seen those things come to pass. So you know what I did? I just focused on doing the works that he did, not even worrying about the greater works, <laughs> amen. And I just started saying, Father, I want to see the dead raised. And I took every scripture in the Bible where a person was raised from the dead, and I, I took them out and put them on, this is before I had a computer, and wrote them on a piece of paper, and I just started meditating. You, before you can meditate on the words, you've got to put the information in before you can sit there and, and allow it to become alive on the inside. So I took this, I meditated on it, I started thinking about it, and then I not only saw Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, I meditated on it until I saw me raising Lazarus from the dead. I saw me lay on top of that boy that Elijah raised from the dead and put my hands, or excuse me, it was Elisha, I think, put my hands on his hands, my uh, lips on his lips, and I, I laid on a bed and imagined myself doing it. And I know some of you think, you're weird. Well, it worked. I'm telling you what works. I saw me, I meditated and I got to where I would dream every night of raising 20 or 30 people from the dead. It's just, it consumed me. And then guess what? A guy died in one of my services and we saw him raised from the dead. And I started seeing people raised from the dead. And then it was like 10, 15 years later and I thought, you know, I haven't seen anybody raised from the dead lately. And so I went back and started meditating on these things and got to where I was dreaming about it and seeing it. And then my son died and was dead for five hours. And praise God, Jamie and I believed God. And he came back from the dead. And he's the one that, he's the one that put up this screen. He's the one that puts all of this stuff up. And he's doing great. Amen. He was in a morgue, stripped naked with a toe tag on, pronounced dead for nearly five hours, came back to life because I was meditating. I saw it. See, there's a lot of people that can quote you the scriptures, but they see themselves sick. They think sick. They dream sick. When they go on a vacation, they plan sick. They bring all their sickness stuff with them. They don't go to certain places because it's allergy season and you, you just... You think and your whole life revolves around being sick. You're praying for healing, but you see yourself sick. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the direction that you see it going. And some of you, oh no, that's not true. My life's a wreck and I'm praying. You may be praying and begging and pleading for it, but it is going the direction you see your life going. Amen or oh me. Some of you need to say, oh me. You're praying for all of these good things, but you see yourself a failure. You see yourself sick. You see yourself. You're, that's more real to you than the promises of God. You need to get to a place to where God's word is more real to you than what you see. So they had promises. They saw them. Abraham saw himself the father of many nations. I think this is one reason that the Lord used those two examples of the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore because they didn't live in a house the way we do. They didn't, you know, at night, they weren't inside with artificial light. They had to sit outside of a tent. And every night they saw the stars. They lived in a desert area where nearly every night it was clear. He saw the stars nearly every single night. Every day he wore sandals. He had to clean the dust off of his feet. Day and night... For at least 25, 26 years, Abraham kept thinking, that's how numerous my children are going to be. God gave him something that kept this in front of him day and night. He saw 
himself. He saw these promises coming to pass and then they were persuaded of them. If you turn over to Romans chapter 4, uh, Paul was giving an account of Abraham and he said he was fully persuaded. He wasn't just persuaded, he was fully persuaded. The way you get fully persuaded is to just focus on it, stand there, speak it until you remove all doubt. You can get to a place where you are not plagued with doubt. Most Christians don't understand that. They think that you just have to constantly live with doubt. You can get to a place where you're so focused on God, you don't know how to do anything but believe God. I gave that example, I think, yesterday about the doctor telling me I needed open heart surgery and I just couldn't believe it because that's not what I was believing for. It's not what I saw. And I told him, I said, you're a liar. And praise God, I didn't need open heart surgery. But you can get to a place where God's word is so real, you don't know how to disbelieve God. I know some of you are thinking, oh man, that is completely off the charts. That's because you aren't meditating in the word day and night. So Abraham, they had promises. They saw those promises in their imagination, in their heart. And they were persuaded, fully persuaded. They embraced them. This is talking about using your emotions, your passion. It has to become a passion for you. I'm passionate about what God has told me to do. I'm consumed with it. You have to get to where it's not just an add-on to your life. It's not an appendage. It is the focus of your life. You have to be passionate about the things of God. Man, I could spend more time on that. I'm wanting to get on to some other things. But then it says, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Again, this is talking about your words have to get involved. Faith is voice activated. Psalms chapter 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Almighty shall, ab or how does that go? Did I say that right? He that dwelleth in the secret place, Psalms 91, 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. And that psalm goes on to say that no plague will come nigh our dwelling. Did you know that that's a promise to every one of you? You've got a promise that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. That means that COVID can't affect you. You've got that promise, but how many of you have received that and personalized it as that's for me? How many of you have seen it in your heart? You see yourself well. How many of you have been fully persuaded to where you remove all doubt and you embrace it and then you're bold enough to start saying that no germ can touch my body and live. There's a lot of you that know these promises but they aren't personal. You would not never say it because you're afraid it may not work. That means that you still got doubt about it. Amen. I'm not against you. I'm just telling you the truth. If what I say rubs you the wrong way, be as smart, you know, as when you're petting a cat and you pat it the wrong way so all its hair stands up. The way you solve that is just turn the cat around and keep petting, amen, and it'll all lay down. If what I've said rubs you the wrong way, repent, turn around, and this goes feeling good. Amen. <laughs> it's voice activated. You have to say of the Lord. And then in verse um, 14, it says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. In verse 15, this is one of the most important things God ever spoke to me in my life. I use this constantly. It says, And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. For them, returning to Ur the Chaldees was sin. God told them not to go back. And so this is saying that they would have been tempted to sin if they would have been mindful of the country that they came out. You can turn this verse around and say it this way, and I still believe it's accurate, that if you aren't mindful of something, if it doesn't come into your mind, if you don't think on it, you can't even be tempted. You can't be tempted with something that you don't think. You couldn't be tempted with unbelief if you didn't think things that gender unbelief. 
Unbelief comes by hearing, just like faith comes by hearing. But it comes by hearing the ten spies instead of the two spies that were speaking faith. Most people are so conflicted and so tempted because they are so exposed to doubt and unbelief. If you were to put Abraham in your lifestyle, listening to the stuff you listen to, he wouldn't get any better results than you get. And if you put yourself into Abraham's lifestyle to where day and night for 25, 26 years, all you do is focus on what God said, you'd get the same results that Abraham get. You need to quit meditating and focusing and listening and allowing the sewage of the world to flow through you because it'll make your heart wax cold. It'll turn you, it'll make this negativity of the world overwhelm you. But if you don't even think on this stuff, you won't even be tempted. You know, let me give you this. I need to quit right now. Let me give you one last example and I'll quit. But uh, I was raised in uh, Texas and I was raised in a real uh, isolated situation. I mean, my brother and sister were raised in the same home I was in. My sister uh, talked about suicide and stuff. She never committed it, but she was depressed and had things. My brother got arrested and in, uh, in trouble and when he turned uh, 40 years old, he, he fell down and cried because he thought God was going to kill him before he was 40 for the things he did. So anyway, they grew up in the same home I grew up in. So I guess that there was potential, but I was just taught to love God and for whatever reason, I just chose to do it. And so I guess I heard about prostitution, about dope about gang. I guess I heard all that stuff but it wasn't for me so I never thought about it and it just didn't even register with me and I got turned on to the Lord March the 23rd 1968 my mother thought I lost my mind she took me on a trip to Bern Switzerland for a Baptist youth conference with uh, Billy Graham we went to a conference there and along the way we uh, went to all these different countries and stuff. And anyway, the first night of this thing, I was in New York City and we were in Times Square. We were staying in a hotel that was on Times Square. And man, this hick from Texas had never seen any of the stuff that was going on in New York City. And I was just gobsmacked. That's what the English call it, gobsmacked. Gob is your mouth. And I was just walking around with my mouth open looking at all this stuff. And I had hundreds and hundreds of tracks. And I, it's two o'clock in the morning. I was walking down alleys and I'd see a gang of people. And I'd go up and just pass them all out tracks and witness to them. I didn't even know enough to be afraid. I guess I'd heard about it, but it, I don't know. It just, I had zero fear. I was witnessing to them and I cleared out all of the alleys. Two o'clock in the morning. And I remember going to 42nd Street and there must have been a hundred prostitutes lined up across, along this wall. And I wasn't sharp enough to realize what they were doing. I just thought, this is awesome. Here's all of these women I can witness to. And I went down the row and passed them all out of track and I started preaching and I cleaned out the entire street. They all left. And so anyway, I was out at 2 and 3 in the morning and just witnessing to every person that I'd see. And um, a pimp came up to me and tried to sell me one of his girls. And he was using the street language and saying, and I kept saying, what? <laughs> like, what? And I mean, this guy, after a few minutes, he just walked off. And I remember him, he, he was shaking his head and he just threw his hands in the air like this, like... What rock did this guy crawl out from under? And I went back to the hotel room I, and the guys that I was with and I started explaining. I said, you never will believe what this guy was saying to me. And I started telling them what he said and they started laughing and they said, he was trying to sell you one of his prostitutes. And you know what? I didn't even know enough to be tempted. I hadn't thought on stuff. It didn't dawn on me that people would do such a thing as that. And here's my point. Guess what? I wasn't even tempted. I didn't have to say, oh Jesus, help me to resist. <laughs> I didn't know enough to be tempted. I wasn't tempted in the least. I didn't have to resist anything. You can't be tempted with what you don't think. 
You know the reason some of you are tempted to commit adultery and the reason some of you are tempted because you look at pornography, you read pornography, you listen, you watch movies that portray adultery and stuff and it affects you emotionally and you're drawn to it. There's a reason that you're struggling with the things that you're struggling with and it's because of the 10 spies network. It's because of all of this stuff. You can't be tempted with something you don't think. So quit thinking on it and you won't be tempted. If all you did was come to a conference like this and all we did all day long was sit and listen to the word and focus on God, man, all you'd be tempted to do is to praise God and to have faith. Amen. But God doesn't want us to stay here in the salt shaker. We've got to go out into the world, but you've got to take these truths that I'm talking about and you've got to protect your heart. Thank you.